We've been speaking about the prayer. And remember, guys, the Prophet taught us to pray the way he prays. He commanded us to pray as you see me pray. This we should be performing our prayer the way he taught us. Not the way somebody else taught us. Not following a mathab or a school of thought. And that's why I'm doing this whole series, you know, which is taking a couple of months. I want to cover the, the prayer from A to Z so you will know the correct way to pray. And you have been told many things that we do during the prayer may break your prayer or invalidate it. For example, we talked about how even with the sutra, how many of you have been told that if a woman walks in front of you when you're praying, your prayer is invalidated, which we know is not correct. If a dog or a donkey walks in front of you, your prayer is invalidated. That is not correct. Well, there are other actions that are allowed during the prayer that you may have been told that if you do them, your prayer is invalidated. And we're going to go over some of those actions today to try to clarify and clear up these misconceptions. How many of you have been told that if you cry or moan or groan while you're praying, it will break your prayer? Well, this is not correct. Crying does not break your prayer. Moaning does not invalidate your prayer. Groaning does not invalidate your prayer. Allah tells us in the Quran and the interpretation, the meaning, when the revelations of the merciful were recited to them, they fell down prostrating and in adoration of what they heard. Adoration, this, the people were crying out, crying out in adoration for what they, they've heard. This is the proof. That these things do not invalidate your prayer. And also we have from the Sunnah. One of the companions tells us that he saw the prophet praying. And he could see the prophet's chest uh, buzzing like a cooking pot due to his crying. And that hadith is authentic. Also another hadith, Ali tells us there were no horsemen amongst us during the battle of Badr except for one man. And I saw that not any of us was standing except the prophet who was praying under a tree and he was crying until the dawn. So here, the prophet used to cry when praying. So that does not invalidate your prayer. Also, we have another hadith where Aisha, the wife of the prophet, tells us that when the prophet was going through his sickness before dying, he said, oh, Aisha, go tell Abu Bakr to lead the pre people in prayer. So she said, but oh, prophet of Allah, Abu Bakr is very soft hearted. He cannot control his tears. Whenever he recites the Quran, he cries. The prophet said, do as I told you to do and go tell Abu Bakr to lead the people in prayer. So the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam insisted that Abu Bakr lead the prayer, you know, after he was told that Abu Bakr cries, it shows it's permissible. It's permissible to cry while praying. And also we have another hadith where as Umar, Umar prayed the Fajr prayer. And when he was reciting Surah Yusuf, when he got to a particular verse, he began to cry, but he continued with his prayer. So again, guys, for those people who tell you that you cannot cry or moan or groan because it's considered talking, 
And it, talking breaks the prayer. Understand moaning, groaning, and crying are not the same as talking. It's not the same. If I cry as I read or, or re recite the words of Allah, that's not the same as me sitting on, in the prayer saying, oh, hold on for me in Allah. Hey, y'all know what happened at work today with me? That's not the same thing as talking to someone. Okay? So again, be careful when people tell you things are haram. You know, if they don't bring you the proof to support it, or they play the word game, because a lot of people don't have common sense, especially Muslims. You don't know the difference between speaking and crying. You don't know the difference between speaking and moaning. Then something's wrong with you. What about this? How many of you have been told that if you turn to the right or the left when you are praying, you break your prayer? Well, that's not correct either. Ibn Abbas tells us that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would turn to his right or his left and he would not turn his head to see beyond him. So again, turning does not break your prayer. We have another hadith where another person says when the Prophet prayed, he looked toward the valley because he had seen some horsemen. He had sent some horsemen to guard the valley. So when you're praying, if you want to look over at something, say, for example, you know, you're making salat and you happen to see out the corner of your eye a baby crawling toward the stairs. What are you going to do? Sit there and keep on praying and ignore the child? So there's nothing wrong with looking to see oh, something, okay? Also, another hadith, another companion says, I saw Anas, the son of Malik, lift his eyes to look at something while he was praying. You know, so there's nothing wrong with that. This does not break your prayer. And the same with moving. How many of you were told that if you do too many movements, you know, your prayer is invalidated? Well, guess what? Aisha, the wife of the prophet, she said, I asked the prophet about turning in your prayer. And he said, it is the portion that the shaitan may steal from you, but it may not necessarily invalidate it. Now, you know, we talked about how we should be careful to not make too many unnecessary movements. But you cannot say that because that sister scratched her leg or she turned a little bit too much, her prayer has to be remade over. No, uh, the shaitan may steal from your prayer, which means take away some of the reward. But is the prayer invalidated? No. Also, we have another hadith where the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, oh, people, be careful about turning because there is no prayer for the one who turns. If you have to turn, do it during the voluntary prayers, but try to avoid them in the obligatory. Because again, he was telling us to avoid it, not because it invalidates your prayer, but it may decrease the reward you receive. Remember, we talked about how a person can make a salat and may walk away with one third or one reward, two rewards. But to say it's invalidated is incorrect. Okay. Also, we have another hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah faces the person while the person is in prayer and while the person remains facing Allah. But if the person turns, then Allah will turn away from you. So we want to try to stay focused. We talked about Kushua. Okay, we talked about Kushua before, having that focus, that concentration during a prayer. You know, the less Kushua you have, the less reward. But can I say that your prayer is totally invalidated? No. And also, guys, another thing I want to stress, we're talking about turning the face. All these hadiths about turning is turning to look at something with your face. I want to turn and look over to the right. Turn and look over to the left. Okay, but if you turn away from the Qibla, then you have to be careful. You remember that? We talked about, because remember, we talked about the pillars of the prayer. One of the pillars of the prayer is you should face the direction of the Qibla. 
So you do want to be careful to not turn your body, to turn your body away from the Qibla. Because if you turn your body away from the Qibla, that could possibly invalidate your prayer. What about walking away from the prayer? How many of you have heard the hadith where as Aisha tells us that the prophet was praying in the house and she couldn't get in. So she started knocking on a door. She didn't know he was praying. She couldn't get in the house. So she knocked at the door. The prophet came and opened the door and then he went back to his prayer. That hadith is the proof that if a person has to leave the prayer for a moment to deal with a pressing need, such as a person being locked out the house or say your child is about to fall down the stairs, as long as you continue to face the direction of the Qibla, this is okay. And all you have to do is go back to your prayer and resume where you left off. So let me give an example. You're making salat. As you're standing up reciting the Fatiha, you hear uh, your children bang at the door. Mom, mom. Okay, you, so you stop reciting and you start to walk backwards. You're facing the Qibla. You walk to the door. You open the door and then you go back to the prayer and continue. This is okay. Or say, for example, you are praying, and as you are bowing, you happen to see when you look behind you that the baby is crawling towards the steps. So you stand up and continue to face the Qibla and walk backwards and grab the baby and hold it in your arms and come back to the prayer. This is permissible. You do not have to restart the prayer over or anything else. You pick up where you left off. And again, as long as it's not too many steps. Of course, I ain't going to keep facing the Qibla and go to the store. I'm not going to sit there and leave the house and go to the grocery store and, and, and keep going. No, as long as it's not a lot of steps. Because if you take too many steps, it could invalidate your prayer. But if you're going to go and get the child or open the door or something like that, it's okay. That does not break your prayer. You don't have to restart the prayer either. And also, say, for example, you go to get the child. Can I hold the child and continue praying? The answer is yes. We have the hadith, whereas the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, was delivering the prayer, and he had his grandson on his neck. The prophet made takbir for the prayer and during the prayer he made a long prostration and he would put the child down. And then when he stood up, he picked him back up and put him back over his shoulders like this man is doing in this picture here. This is permissible. Or you got an infant child, you want to hold it in your arms while you're praying. This is permissible. It doesn't break your salat. Again, guys, the, the religion is easy. When Allah imposed the uh, obligations on us, it wasn't to punish us. It's to make us better people, but he made it easy for us to fulfill our obligations to him. We just need to learn to seek the true knowledge and understanding of, of Islam. And what about this? Say you are making salat and somebody comes in the house and says, Salam alaikum, I'm home, mom. Can you respond? Well, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam once day sent a companion somewhere. And when the companion came back, he found the Prophet praying. So when he spoke to the Prophet, uh, uh, the Prophet motioned with his hands to wave to him. So there's nothing wrong with that. Say, for example, you're standing up making salat. Your child comes home from school. Salam alaikum, mom. I'm home. You can wave your hand and keep praying. You don't stop praying. You keep on praying and you can wave your hand. We have another hadith where another companion said, I walked by the prophet while he was praying and I greeted him and he responded to me by signaling with his hand, by waving. He was signal with his hand. 
Or you can raise your finger up like, okay, I'm here, one minute. Or you can nod your head. You're making salat and somebody walk past you and give you salams, you can nod your head. All of these actions were done by the prophet and they do not invalidate your prayer. You see that, guys? So again, it just goes to show that most Muslims don't know their religion. You're going to tell me it's haram for me to wave when I'm praying to, to, and greeting or to nod my head in recognition to a person who greets me? You don't know anything about the prophet, even though you claim to be a Sunnah follower. SubhanAllah. Also, what if, a, if the imam makes a mistake? If the imam makes a mistake in the prayer, it's allowed for the men to say SubhanAllah. Which again, you can't tell me it's how wrong to talk. I can talk if it's remembrance of Allah or related to the prayer like this or moaning or groaning. Okay, if the imam makes a mistake, you the men should say subhanAllah to get his attention. And the women can clap their hands to get the intention. We have a hadith whereas the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if someone is faced with a, with a problem during the prayer, he should say subhanahu Allah and clapping is for the women. Subhanahu Allah is for the men. Women can clap their hands to let the imam know that he did not do enough rakats or that he did too many rakats or that he's not bowing. And the man should say, subhanAllah, subhanAllah, to get his attention to let him know. Okay? And then finally, this is an email that I got just the other day. What if you're making salat and somebody sneezes? Can I say, uh, um, uh, uh, alhamdulillah, or whatnot? Well, one of the companions tells us, I was praying behind the prophet and I sneezed. And I said, Alhamdulillah. And the prophet said, who was that that spoke during the prayer? And nobody said anything. He asked again, and nobody said anything. This companion was afraid to admit that it was him because he thought he did something wrong. So finally he said, it was me, O prophet of Allah, who said it. And the prophet said, Subhanallah, Allah, by the one in whose hand is my soul, 30-something angels came running to get that phrase to raise it to their Lord. So that's the proof. There's nothing wrong with you saying Alhamdulillah when you sneeze or Yahamakallah, Yahamakallah when you sneeze, when a person sneezes during a prayer. That does not break the prayer. So if you're making Salah and you sneeze, Alhamdulillah. Or and somebody says Yahamakallah, okay, or whatever, that does not break the prayer. So thus, guys, I want you to remember the religion is easy. Allah makes the rules and the obligations for our betterment, not to punish us. We make the religion hard on ourselves. And we make the religion hard on others by not educating ourselves, by not finding teachers. So many Muslims today think that they can pick up the Hadith books and start reading on their own and they're going to walk away understanding the those Hadiths. That's not true. The only way you're going to understand this religion is to sit, as the prophet said, to sit in the company of the people of knowledge and learn directly from them. You have to have a teacher. Every Muslim on this planet should have a teacher. I should be able to ask you, who's your teacher? And you should say, oh, uh, Imam so-and-so or sister so-and-so or Sheikh so-and-so. Every Muslim should have a teacher. You cannot teach yourself. And that teacher should be a bona fide, qualified teacher. A person who has studied the Quran and studied the Hadith intensely by from another person of knowledge. Until we do that, we will never truly understand this religion and Islam will always be distorted like it is today and it will continue to become distorted to the point of becoming strange until we get back to the, the basics and get real qualified teachers to help educate us. Listening to lectures on the internet is not going to get it. Just because you listen to a person give lectures, uh, I'm talking about you listen to recordings. Because you look at videos on YouTube, doesn't mean nothing. 
because most times you're going to twist what those people say around the mean things that they didn't mean. Unless you are learning directly from that person. That person knows you and you know them. That person can quiz you. That person can question you. That person can drill you with, with, like I'm doing you guys here. You're not learning nothing and you're not a student. Okay. All right. We'll stop right here for today. Tomorrow we're going to talk about things that you cannot do during the prayer. So we'll stop. Sunnah Baba, protectors of the Sunnah. Sunnah Baba, protectors of the Sunnah.